Hello everybody. Let's go through really quick the uh, protocol slides before I turn it over to Elena. Everybody will be kept on mute to minimize the sound uh, and Elena will stop at certain periods to see if anybody has any questions. If you have a question, raise your hand over here. That's what the little hand is uh, here. Raise it uh, and we'll be able to uh, talk to you then. Uh, if you do have a microphone uh, to ask the question, we will unmute you. But as soon as you're finished talking, please mute yourself again. If you don't have a microphone and if you have questions, you can also use the little chat box here to uh, type us the messages. Um, and then we'll, we'll either help you with whatever problem you might have or um, we'll let Elena know when, when she pauses. Okay, so that's about all I've got here. I'm going to turn it over to Elena now so she can start her. Can I, can I start recording now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. And before we start, we will, uh, as usually, do a short alignment. So please, everybody, relax. quiet and uh, lower fields. Focus the attention in the head. And imagine the light of the soul pouring through the mental body. and integrating the personality. You sound the om three times and imagine the white golden light illuminating the mental body Purifying the astral body. And strengthening the etheric body. Visualize the threefold personality as being unified with the white light. Personality soul fusion. See the lower triangle representing the personality with the mental body at the apex and the physical and astral bodies at the base of the triangle. See 
see the apex of the triangle pointing upwards. Above the lower triangle see the brightly lit higher triangle representing the soul with its apex pointing downwards. By an act of the will, see these two triangles merging together and forming a six-pointed star. See the six-pointed star as a sh shining sun, representing the soul-infused personality. And sound the silent OM to confirm this fusion. group alignment. Visualize a sphere of pure white light and the group members as miniature shining suns inside and around the sphere. See a sphere of light linking the heart centers of all the group members. Sphere of light linking the head centers. and a sphere of light linking the Ajna centers of all the group members. Imagine the light rapidly circulating through these three spheres. and aligning the three group centers, Ajna, Heart and Head, into one mind, one soul and one will. To confirm the group alignment, we sign the OM as a group. Om. Thank you, everybody. Um, in my last webinar, there was no time to finish the astrology in relation to Daniyasin. And again today, I would really like to finish the discussion on Dharma and thus finally conclude the first instruction. But before uh, we start, I'd just like to mention a couple of things and uh, that is the importance of the nodal axis. It means 
the north and south node polarity and the importance of the utilization of the will and the first ray in relation to the sannyasin. Because it is the first ray uh, which always brings withdrawal and abstraction. And uh, is the ray of destroyer or of death. It is also important to know that um, even though uh, we have not a particular ray in our present ray makeup which we hypothesize for ourselves, we could have uh, we could have it uh, strongly manifesting through our astrological chart. Oh. Um, CDP didn't have first, third, fourth, or seventh ray in her present ray makeup but astrologically they were present and she expressed and used them in her life some more than other and some for a particular purpose like for example for building of her garden upon the mental plane she strongly utilized the fourth and seventh ray it is always possible that she could have some of these rays present as a sub-race uh, but DK didn't go to such details to complicate or already difficult subject of the race uh, but uh, he hinted for some of the disciples their presence through not a direct reference but uh, by hinting Uh, as I mentioned in my other webinars, each astrological energy such as a planet, sign, aspect uh, and various points as ascendant, the midheaven, uh, can be interpreted from a number of different levels of consciousness and stages of the path. And in relation uh, to a particular theme and consideration. So that is why our prime focus has been a sannyasin and today it will be duty, dharma and obligation. So if I mention any astrology uh, it would be particularly related to these uh, aspects of duty, dharma and obligation and particularly in relation uh, to the disciples CDP. So um, uh, we start or continue with the discussion uh, uh, on dharma. Uh, you know, we tend to uh, mention Dharma most out of the three, duty, Dharma, obligation. Whenever we even looking at the chart, we, we tend to say, you know, discuss what is our Dharma. But do we really understand what do we mean by Dharma exactly? Okay? And that's why I decided to go, you know, into a little bit a deeper discussion uh, about the four spheres which uh, DK mentioned in, uh, in the esoteric healing. That's why I ask uh, for you to read it prior to this webinar that you have some idea and your 
own perception and your own understanding what he's really trying to say there because that is the only place where he actually divide these uh, spheres or words duty starting from instinct, duty, dumb and obligation. So what I, what I uh, am going to do is uh, to put on the screen for you uh, first the references, some of the references where DK is actually um, telling us what is Dharma. And uh, I will read it. Dharma means duty, obligation. All groups involved in esoteric work have their own Dharma or duty and all have their peculiar objective. Aspirants to discipleship have a specific obligation to develop the intuition. This is a reference from the Glamour book, page one. The second reference is from Light of the Soul, page 187 where he says, Dharma means literally the proper working out of one's obligation or karma in the place, surroundings and environment where fate has put one. And the last one from Esoteric Healing 686, he says, Da is that aspect of karma which dignifies any particular world cycle and the lives of those implicated in its working out. Now, in all these references, DK seems to equate duty with Dharma an obligation which, with a strong relation to karma, particularly to dharma. But there is another reference in Esoteric Healing 688 where it says the following. The whole of life experience from the sphere of nativity up to the highest limits of spiritual possibility are covered by four words applicable at various stages of evolution. They are instinct, duty, dharma, obligation. An understanding of the differences serves to bring illumination and consequently right action. Now, in this reference, he is telling us that there is a difference between these four words and each are related to a particular stage of the path. It means that when we know where we stand upon the path, one or more of these words can become applicable to our life or to our next step ahead uh, with more understanding, a better vision and that result in the right action and better or right fulfillment of our duty, dharma, karma, or obligation. And he confirms this by the following statement, which is in Esoteric Healing, page 688. 
It will be apparent to you, therefore, how essential it is that all disciples and initiates should know exactly where they stand upon the path. The final aspect of the ladder of evolution. Otherwise, they will misinterpret the call and fail to recognize the soul of the outgoing sound. How easily this can happen becomes apparent to every advanced teacher of occultism and esotericism when he perceives how easily unimportant people and beginners interpret calls and messages they hear or receive as coming from some high and elevated source, whereas they are in all probability hearing that which emanates from their own subconscious, from their own souls, or from some teacher, not a master, who is attempting to help them. Now, this is a very important for us to hear, and uh, it is very clear message from the master to all of us, and I don't think it needs much elaboration what he is actually saying here. He is only uh, confirming how very important and fundamental to our spiritual progress is to know where we are in a level of consciousness, stages of the path, and the initiatory process. And uh, for those of us who are esoteric astrologists, psychologists, or healers, it also becomes fundamental or vital that we know the person in front of us, where he or she stands, if we are to help or guide him or her in uh, their spiritual life, and indicate the next step ahead. Now, um, when we look at these four spheres uh, in the esoteric healing, pages 685 to 688, uh, which are discussed by DK, they are discussed particularly in relation to the healing law 10 which he says is the most mysterious law and it's a new law which is substituting the law of death. And he, he is saying that only those who have passed the second initiation and are approaching the third can really understand this law, uh, particularly the later part of that law. And he has chosen to discuss these four spheres in greater detail and in, in the only place in all of his books and he never does anything without a very good reason. So from here, we need to extract as much information uh, as we are able to do so. And obviously, each of us will understand what he is saying according to his or her own level of consciousness, and the stage of the path. It means what I am presenting here is my own understanding. 
I have adapted this division of these four spheres to the life, our own life, the aspirants, the disciples, and the initiates on various levels of the past. And I try to look also at the disciple CDP and approximate through this fair where she was moving through and what was ap applicable to her life. Now, we know that our evolution of consciousness and a, a spiritual development is a process. We go through a major and minor stages and levels, planes and subplanes, which are already state of consciousness. And these interpenetrate each other. Uh, so everything is in constant movement. There is not a room or stage where we say, oh, we've done that, we close the door and we move forward. No. There is a lot of unfinished work or undeveloped qualities which we need to work upon simultaneously as we move forward until we reach a final or complete achievement of that particular stage or initiation, it means that even we are approaching the third initiation and we have unfinished business in relation to the first or second initiation, we cannot take the third initiation until we complete all what we need to have acquired or learned at those prior two initiations. So, for example, development of the personality integration um, starts at the end of probationary path and is completed finally at the third initiation in the emergence of a powerful, completely integrated personality, which we also call the dweller on the threshold, which is facing the angel of the presence for the final fight. So we see that process has taken many lives and three initiations to actually come to a final conclusion. And by analogy, I see this process applied also to these four words and four spheres of instinct, duty, dharma, and obligation, which are applicable at various stages of evolution and I have decided to call them the four spheres of Dharma because uh, the word Dharma is mostly used by everybody. So even though we can uh, correlate each of these four spheres to a particular major stage of evolution or the stage of the past, in its major division, uh, I can see each of them interpenetrating and is being part of the other spheres, but on a different levels of consciousness. Now, we cannot say, for example, that a sense of responsibility or sense of duty is not part of the sphere of obligation 
or that the sense of obligation is not part of the sphere of duty or the sphere of Dharma, because it is, but only from a different level of manifestation, expression or level of consciousness and the stage of the path. For example, uh, the instinct is automatically present in the higher spheres of duty, dharma and obligation. That is why, that is the reason why DK in those references which we read seem to equate all these but also differentiate them. But he is simply speaking from different levels. Now, each of these four spheres, as I say, can be correlated to a major division. But each of these major division as each, as the major division of the past, has its own sub-stages. And now, I will, we, will, we are going to look what he actually says about these four spheres. Uh, I have not copied them absolutely word by word, but extracted some parts of them. But this is what he says. Esoteric Healing 685 Our whole life experience is covered by four words, which are applicable at various stages of evolution. Instinct, duty, Dharma, obligation, and the understanding of the differences will bring illumination and consequently right action. And now he is starting to describe them. And the first is the sphere of instinct. And he says, this refers to the instinctual world of give and take, of the fulfillment and the simple animal instinct of the obligation which any assumed responsibility brings even when undertaken without understanding, such as the instinctual care of a mother for her child. Instinctual living is the embryonic expression in the life of a disciple of the divine aspect of intelligent application. Now, what he is actually telling us here, um, he, is, he is starting from the lowest aspect and trying to indicate the highest, but not completely so, from my understanding. Here the animal instinct controls the fulfillment of instinctual, instinctual obligation which people take uh, as assumed responsibilities even they don't truly understand why. But we all know that the five senses or instincts have to be transmuted into the higher counterparts. 
So the instinct uh, in its early stages is evidence uh, by a form, a material mechanism, right? Or personality uh, to its material environment, which are the three worlds of human evolution. Physical, astral, mental. In this case, talking about a lower mental plane. Uh, uh, later, when the mind appears as an integrated agency, because we remember even when we integrating the personality, the mind is the highest aspect of the personality, which is the integrating agent of the three lower bodies. So later when the mind appears uh, as the inter integrating agent, um, relationship becomes clarified and then the next energy which comes in is the energy of the soul. So the instinctual activity or obligation is what DK is telling us is the intelligent, as you read there, is the intelligent application. Okay? through the gradual development of the mind. The next level of the instinct is the spiritual instinct, the lowest aspect of intuition as the capacity of the soul to register contact with the hierarchy. And it is this spiritual instinct which must be present in order for us to take the first initiation. The higher level of the intelligent application through the contact with the soul is the illumined mind. The soul light illumined the mind. And we have a spiritual intelligence. And these two, illumined mind and spiritual intelligence, are definite signs for taking the second initiation. And then is coming the intuitive instinct, indicating the preparedness for the third initiation. So you see what I am doing here. I am raising the instinct from the basic animal instinct up to the highest instinct, which is the intuitive instinct. And obviously, I have no time to really go into detail of this. Um, uh, because we have no time, really, uh, to spend on this. I am just giving you some of my thoughts. Uh, so, we see here that the thought power, mental power, and spiritual instinct are related and work constructively together. In the case of the spiritual instincts or the instincts related to the spiritual triad, it is the intuition which interprets and illumines the mind. We need to carefully differentiate between the illumination as produced in meditation at the early stages where the mind becomes illumined by the soul 
and that stage of illumination, which is the result of the evocation of the higher will, which will bring illumination of direct knowledge or pure reason to the mind, or in other words, we become intuitive. We need to read carefully DK, and when he uses the word spiritual, he uses it from a different levels. So we need to carefully, correctly interpret and understand that level from which he is speaking. Okay? Instinctual service is present on the level of the soul on its own plane. It is the natural or instinctual quality of the soul to serve. When we are at that level of the soul, there we don't think or ask, where is our service? What we should be doing? We just know. We don't think about it. We know because we are the soul and serving as a soul. And this is a very high stage of evolution and initiatory process in order to instinctively serve. And to my understanding, this is possible somewhere between the second and third initiation. So, from the perspective of instinct, in its early stages of expression and of development, we can relate this sphere of instinct to the path of evolution where we find the whole humanity prior to entering the path of probation. From a perspective of the development of the higher or spiritual instincts, uh, these will become part also of the spheres of duty, dharma and obligation, according to the level of consciousness and stage of the path reached by the disciple or initiate. When we look at uh, CDP in relation to this, I might put up her chart. This is her natal chart. For those of you who are seeing the chart for the first time, here are her race, second ray soul, sixth ray personality, fifth ray mind, sixth ray astral body, and six ray, physical body or brain. Now, CDP uh, had actually a very powerful instinctual nature represented astrologically uh, with a powerful torus which rules the senses. and cancer, cancerizing, cancer decanate of Pisces, her dharmic duty, poet, and moon in a Pisces decanate of Scorpio, ruler of the dharma, duty, obligation, and her ascendant. So she is going through a process from a very basic instinctual nature 
towards their higher instincts or spiritual instincts. Because cancer is the sign of instinctual life and mass placed in Taurus in the last decanate or Capricorn decanate of Taurus it's relating her to the Dharma which is the 10th house and so all this is related to her process how and what stage of the duty, dharma or obligation she is passing through. So Mars in Taurus brings also strong, strong emphasis on instinctual nature. And Venus, which is conjuncting the Mars, are being in the 12th house, which is a Pisces house, ruling the Dharma duty, responsibility, and obligation. So both of these planets are automatically related to that process. Venus is also ruling the 12th house because it rules Taurus. And so this conjunction automatically brings into the relation the Taurian energy and Mars being ruler of Scorpio brings the Moon being in the Piscean decanate or Cancer decanate of Pisces and a Cancer ascendant together. because this is our major focal point, the highest elevating point in the chart, the MC indicates our Dharma, our duty, our responsibility and our obligation. So this combination of forces which I am mentioning here through these two planets, stimulate the senses, psychic forces, powerful, the most powerful forces of Cancer and Pisces together are coming also through this conjunction in the Piscean house and creating a highly emotional and also possessive Taurus nature and a glamour, a major glamour. And she had many glamours. But we will only look at her glamours in relation to her duty and a glamour of responsibility in relation to this Dharma and Karma duty and obligation. Now we can follow both these planets, Venus, Mars, in relation to the fifth house of children. I'm focusing only on the important point which we are considering because she had, she loved her family and her children uh, with such a powerful uh, identification uh, that it was creating a major problem to her spiritual progress. Now, a Venus is not only ruling the 12th Piscean house, but it is ruling the 5th house where is the moon that's the mother, that's the motherhood. Uh, Libra fifth house. 
A Venus is also in its exaltation in Pisces, Pisces decanate of Scorpio, and Pisces Dharma, duty. And Libra rules relationships of all kinds of relationships. Sense of proportion, decision. Mars is the ruler of Scorpio and the Moon in its exaltation in Taurus. So we see a powerful relationship developing from a number of directions. So this strong instinctual nature was in a process of highest transmutation but was one of the contributing factors behind her glamour of ties to those she loved and a glamour of responsibilities of motherhood thus making her work achieving detachment very difficult and also very unpredictable and not constant because the moon is squaring Uranus which rules esoterically the fifth house Libra but this is the way she should go and work with because Uranus being exalted in Scorpio it will help her in achievement of that detachment. We can see through this process that her soul consciously decided, when we talk about soul, it's her really, it's us, uh, to put her in these very difficult circumstances in order to learn the detachment and find release and freedom from the ties, from the emotional ties. She, she thought her duty and responsibility as a mother was to take care of her family and her children. You see, the moon, holding the cancer decanate of Piscean Dharma here, and also making a trine aspect to that Dharma. Okay? She had no other profession. She didn't work. And so she considered her profession, her family, taking care of her family. And this further complicated her spiritual life. But here we also, you know, as we deeper and deeper into her chart, we're discovering uh, the major obstacles and the major work she need to do in order to find the release from these chains and prison, which is also indicated by the Saturn placement in Pisces. Karma, both karmic energies, Pisces, Saturn, and da Dharma is particularly related to karma. So she has passed out of the sphere of the elementary instinctual obligation by developing the spiritual instinct which enabled her to take the first initiation in the response to the call of the soul coming from the sphere of duty and through a steadily growing soul control she acquired sense of responsibility which is the higher aspect of the 
instinct, a divine aspect. So we see in this example I am presenting here that we cannot say that our instinctual nature is not present even we are on the path of discipleship. But because she was under the influence of the glamour of duty, it led her to overemphasize the sense of responsibility for those she loved. Slowing down automatically her spiritual progress. And causing a loss of time. She was basically emphasizing the non-essentials because she lacked discrimination. And DK clearly states that she did lack that discrimination. To discern between the essential and the non-essential. So, uh, coming back now to the second division, the sphere of duty. And this is what DK say about the sphere of duty. This call of duty comes from human consciousness, affecting all classes of human beings, and demands from them, life after life, the strict fulfillment of duty. The doing one's duty for which one gets a little appreciation is the first step towards the unfoldment of that divine principle which we call the sense of responsibility, which when unfolded indicates a steadily growing soul contact. The fulfillment of duty, the sense of responsibility and the desire to serve are the three aspects of discipleship in its embryonic stage. The living activity of duty is the embryonic expression in the life of a disciple of the divine aspect of responsible love. Now, What he is telling us here that there is this process through in this sphere of duty of many lives spent by all different classes of people in the strict ful fulfillment of duty which uh, nobody thanks them for. They don't receive any or small appreciation for it. But this is the first step towards the unfoldment of the sense of responsibility. Uh, so through a gradual aspiration towards something higher, there is the emergence of the aspirant and then the appearance of the probationary disciple upon the later stages of the path of probation taking the first initiation upon the early stages of the path of discipleship. There is the emphasis on a soul contact and the result, its results uh, are the awakened sense of responsibility uh, and also the expression of goodwill due to the activity of the heart center. So we again are going through the process here from the lowest to the highest expression of that duty. 
and um, for the present, the most appropriate name, uh, how, I, how I would say that from one perspective, we could, uh, we could say that uh, this sphere of duty from a major division could represent the path of probation. But it is, to my understanding, not absolutely correct. Okay? Uh, because we need to look at so many sub-levels of this, which leads us beyond the path of probation. But, you know, it is fundamental that we understand the path of probation is present here. Because there was one disciple in his group called, by the initial LT, SK. Uh, and for him he says the following in Dina 1, page 606. For the present, the most appropriate name for that part of the path of discipleship that you are treading is the way of sacrifice. The sacrifice of your own thoughts, wishes, aims, and dreams. It means for you the treading the rocky way of duty, of dharma, or, or responsible obligation. He even has given him the meditation on duty, dharma, an obligation. Now, this is the only place in all his books where he is telling us that in that path of discipleship we can find ourselves treading the way of sacrifice. Now, this particular disciple was the only one from the whole group who failed to take even the first initiation in that particular life and was suffering from so many glamours that he was holding the whole group and DK asked him to leave the group but later he reinstated him with the explanation that he is taking him under the protection of the ashram for his own good. Uh, this is just one of the reasons, and I'm not going into details, but why I am cho choosing this disciple as an example, because of the emphasis on the duty, dharma, and responsible obligation for a disciple who was the very early stages of the path of discipleship where we are taking the first initiation, he actually through the whole process under Master DK uh, guidance and training developed to be a pledged disciple and what he called accepted disciple taking the first initiation. And the way of sacrifice here, you see, is not the high level of sacrifice where we deal with the law of sacrifice and the higher will, but it is a different level of the past, very early, and different process of the sacrifice. We are we dealing with the basic and fundamental personal issues. Sacrifice of our own thoughts, wishes, aims, and dreams. And he is giving us a hint, mentioning 
the way of sacrifice because we see here the implication of the sevens of first petal of the sacrifice petals in the egoic lotus which is a focal point of the first initiation. And this disciple had a powerful Capricorn. He had Sun, Moon, Mercury and the North Node in Capricorn. He had a Leo rising and that's the Sun in Capricorn. Saturn, the ruler of Capricorn, he had in Aries and his Dharmic point, the MC, was in Aries. Um, this indicates for us the involvement of the powerful Capricorn and Saturn in relation to the MC and 10th house and also of the ascendant or the soul purpose in relation to the duty, Dharma and obligation. So, we see that the, uh, in the early stages uh, the aspirant or the disciple always work in the dark as DK is telling us. Uh, following first the deep hit instinct towards right activity by the hard and persistent performance of duty at first under the pressure of conscience then under the impulse of his awakening soul and under then under the influence of the master he is moving from the dark to the light. Oh. He is mentioning conscience here and you know how do we understand conscience? Because conscience implies the use of the discriminative sense uh, which is developed with the increased control of the mind. It is actually the quality of the soul which gradually evokes, evokes conscience. And through the medium of conscience, awakening and finally awakened consciousness. And this demonstrates first as a sense of responsibility. And it is also that which gradually establishes a growing identification of the soul with the personality. And when DK is telling us, us here, that the divine aspect of duty is a responsible love, what he is actually telling us that now for this responsible love to manifest we need to be in contact with the soul because the sense of responsibility is the effect of the love of the soul okay and this automatically indicate the heart center. And uh, you know when we're talking about this duty, uh, DK is telling us uh, somewhere also that from the perspective of the hierarchy there is no great or little task. Only obedience the next beauty, uh, duty whatever that may be. And in this is also included fulfillment of our ashramic duty, for example. 
So again, we can go through a different levels of that duty because in this sixth sphere of duty we have automatically included the sphere of instinct and those levels of instinct where we find ourselves in relation to our stage where we are. Okay? Because even initiate has his duties to fulfill. So the pledged uh, disciple in the early stages of the path of discipleship where we find CDP has to learn to accept the duty of obedience to the ashramic intent. She was a member of the Master DK's group and as the pledged disciple of his ashram, she was pledged to cooperate and materialize his plans. It was their duty as a group, not from the perspective that he as a master demanded it from them, or from blind obedience, but from their free choice and identity of purpose as far as they could understand or realize it from the stage where each of them were. So, relationship, I will bring the chart relationship to the ashram, to the master, to the hierarchy is also seen from the axis of the MC and IC, the lowest and highest points of the chart, where this is related, the Dharma duty obligation to the ashram, fourth house represents the ashram particularly, and here are the masters, are the hierarchy as the highest uh, point for our obligation and duty. So we, when we're looking at, at the chart and trying to discover either our duty, dharma or obligation, in relationship also to the ashram or the hierarchy or the master, we need to look at these axes. And for, uh, for CDP, you know, it was the Cancer Decanate of Pisces and a Capricorn Decanate of Virgo. You see, if we superficially look at this chart and we're looking for Capricorn now, we say, well, where is she has nothing in Capricorn. Where else do we see Capricorn? But we see it here. The most important point is the Capricorn decanate of Virgo, Capricorn decanate of the very important planet, Mars in relation to her test in Scorpio. And we see a powerful Saturn in relation to this Capricorn energies in relation being placed in parties where the Dharma duty and obligation is. And so, and we have Mercury in its aesthetic placement in Aries, higher mental plane, and the North Node in the Capricorn house. 
So she has a very powerful Capricorn energies. We only need to find them and rightly interpret them. Okay? Now, for example, I unfortunately, I wish I had more time to go into details in this uh, interpretation now, uh, but um, for example, the Saturn rulership of the Capricorn decanate of the Virgo in relation to her ashramic duties and responsibilities indicates that the duty of obedience to the ashramic intent must be taken very seriously. It are not light energies here. Capricorn uh, and Virgo with the emphasis on stabilization, discipline, and upon the mental plane, there are mental energies, okay? And she had to work from the mental plane for the ashram and the hierarchy. The moon is the esoteric ruler of Virgo, okay? Ruling also the dharmic point here as a cancer decanate of Pisces and is the most important planet in relation to her last test for her entry on the, the path of accepted discipleship. but with such a powerful psychic nature. She was spending a lot of time upon the astral plane and DK was telling her, you know, spend more time on the mental plane and working for them, which he meant the hierarchy. Saturn, ruler of Capricorn, is in the ninth house, which is the higher mind and higher mental plane. And it's a mental energy. Okay? So, you see, she had nothing easy here. Because a powerful, instinctual, uh, psychic, astral influences are not easy, you know, to, to work with. And, uh, you know, creating emotional instability and a major, major, uh, you know, deficiency which she lacked was detachment. That was her primary, primary uh, a quality which she was to develop. And the moon is square the Uranus, the esoteric ruler of that fifth house, you know, which she has to work through the square is not an easy aspect to develop that detachment. And Uranus can provide that energy. And it's another mental planet which rules the nine house, higher mental plane and higher mound, ruling through the Aquarian energy where Uranus is the ruler. Okay? So, these are not easy axes to, to have here with the Cancer Capricorn decanates behind them. 
okay? They are the axis of sacrifice, renunciation, healing, you know? There must be the will involved through the Pluto as an esoteric ruler of the Piscean energy to heal and cut these emotional ties and release it to greater service. I find these axes also indication, not necessarily for her soul at the stage where she was, but moving towards that, for those who have a very close relation to the Christ, because this is a line of the path of the world Savior. Okay? There are, we need to consider all the rulers of these signs and the placement of the planets and automatically the Jupiter as the ruler of the Pisces, which is in the house of Virgo. This is another coincidence. Everything fits together with other points of the chart re-emphasizing the theme, you see? And Neptune ruling Pisces and also Virgo because the moon veils Neptune for her as the esoteric ruler of Virgo. And it's the most important planet for her because it is the esoteric ruler of Cancer which is her sole purpose. Unfortunately, I, you know, I cannot continue with this because I have so much to finish and I really like to finish this first instruction today. Um, so we will go to the next sphere which is the third sphere of Dharma. And this is what DK is uh, telling us here. It is the outcome of the sphere of instinct and of the sphere of duty. You see, they are automatically included in here as the, always the highest level, include the lower. And it is that stage where the disciple for the first time recognizes with clarity his part in the whole process of world events and his inescapable share in world development. Dharma is that aspect of karma which dignifies any particular world cycle and the lives of those implicated in its working out. The disciple begins to see that if he shoulders his share of part in this cyclic dharma and works at its fulfillment, he is beginning to comprehend the group work and to do his share in lifting the world karma working out in cyclic dharma. Now that is a sentence. Instinctual service the fulfillment of all duty, now he's summarizing, and sharing in group dharma are all blended in his consciousness and become one great act of living service. He is then moving forward upon the path of discipleship in which the path of probation is completely lost to sight. In the living activity, 
of Dharma is the embryonic expression in the life of the disciple of the divine aspect of will expressed through the plan. Now, I'm just looking at the, at the clock here, that how much time I have for this process and where I should be starting, you know, to a little bit essentialize. Um, we see here that um, uh, he is bringing our attention to that Dharma, particularly in relation to karma, right? And our shouldering, shouldering of the word karma, uh, and if we begin to do that, we are at the same time beginning to comprehend the group work and share in the group dharma. And we also notice that it is in this third sphere of dharma which is DK actually focusing and using the term disciple. Uh, which can be here applicable from the probationary disciple up to the accepted disciple in preparation for the third initiation. Therefore, uh, from a more general but necessarily not the most accurate perspective, uh, we would relate this fair to the path of discipleship as a whole, okay? And the focal point of the divine aspect here is the application of the will in relation to the plan, okay? But that is a very high stage. So, um, again, um, okay, in relation to CDP, now, uh, and her process through these four spheres, we see her transition from the sphere of instinct through acquiring the spiritual instinct taking the first initiation transition from the then including the instinct in the sphere of duty and transition from the sphere of duty into the sphere of Dharma where as a chela in the light uh, which she was prior to entering the third stage of the six stages of discipleship which is the stage of accepted discipleship the chela in the light, the focal point of that stage, she was beginning to shoulder some of the general karma, of the general karma of humanity, and beginning to work with planetary karma to control her emotional or transmute her em emotional karma to work in the light to consciously recognize for the first time that she was doing so and becoming aware of her many glamours and learn 
to deal with them. And as we see in the Saturn in Pisces, is the most difficult placement as both Pisces and Saturn are karmic indicators and indicate necessarily to face the at the, la at the last to face the causes which were set in motion in past lives and face the long-standing condition of emotional prison. Piscean house, 12th house, is a prison house. But the Pisces is also the last sign of the zodiac. It means it is concluding cycle and with her powerful Aries sh should be starting a new cycle and concluding a very difficult karmic cycle which has a causes in previous lives okay Uh, now, again, I cannot, I have to stop and uh, follow the, the uh, sphere of, of um, obligation. This is the four, fourth sphere and this is what DK, this is actually the most difficult part of the Law 10, uh, which DK considered as the highest sphere. Okay? Now, what he says here is this the initiate, having learned the nature of the three other spheres of right action. And through the activity of those spheres, ha having unfolded the divine aspects of intelligent application, which was the sphere of instinct, responsible love, the sphere of duty, and will expressed through plan, the sphere of Dharma passes now into the sphere of obligation. This sphere can be entered only after a large measure of liberation has been achieved and it directs the initiate in two phases of his life. A, in the ashram, where he is governed by the plan, which he recognizes as the expression of his major obligation to life. And he's emphasizing, you know, the significance of that word, life. In the ashram, the life of the spiritual triad gradually supersedes the life of the soul control personality. And B, in Shambhala, where the emerging purpose of Sanat Kumara, of which the plan is an interpretation in time and space, begins to have meaning and significance according to his point in evolution and his approach to the way of the higher evolution. In the council chamber of Shambhala, the life of the monad supersedes all other expressions of the essential reality. Now, this is not easy, is it? Um, what I forgot to tell you 
that in the previous sphere of Dharma, he is, when he is saying this, instinctual service, the fulfillment of all duty, and a sharing in group Dharma are all blended in his consciousness and become one great act of living service. And he is indicating at which stage this is happening. He is then moving forward upon the path of discipleship in which the path of probation is completely lost to sight. Now, to my understanding, he is talking about the latest stages, the last stages of the path of discipleship, because, you know, there is no, we are completely, the path of probation completely, the words completely lost inside is telling us, you know, there is a finalization here of a process. And so we are dealing, we are dealing with the second and third initiation here, which, which are the later stages of the path of discipleship. And that's why he is implying that we enter the sphere of in the obligation as the initiates and initiate the technical term that word is the third degree okay and so he is considering from a number of perspectives he is taking particularly in relation to the law 10 which deals with the fourth initiation he is focusing on this sphere as the highest sphere, starting with the third initiation up to the seventh. And I cannot go into explanation, you know, why I am saying that, because he is giving us hints in the, in the further pages uh, where he is dealing with the law 10. Okay? Um, he is, uh, we are going, you know, to a higher, higher levels here, basically, uh, you know, which, which are related, ready to the higher initiations, but from another perspective, okay, we, we saw that he was using the word obligation at the very early stages. So you see, we need to consider this sphere as we have considered the other sphere, from the lowest to the highest. Because even, even the aspirant at the very beginning of the path of probation has his or her obligations. That's why we need to be very careful that we are correctly or at least approximately establishing either ourselves or those we need to, we, we are trying to help where they are. Otherwise, we cannot align these spheres and their divisions and subdivision correctly. So, Um, from another perspective, which I am coming to the understanding here, is that 
we can understand the term obligation also as implying or referring to our highest goal or our next step ahead which for us at the level and stage we are is the highest goal and there I see also the application of this word obligation and he is stating in one, uh, one uh, statement which we already read somewhere when he says that aspirants to discipleship where the aspirants could be disciples have a specific obligation to develop the intuition it means it is for them the highest goal towards which they should work to develop that intuition which is for them very far indeed okay so um, he's also telling us that as disciples we need to learn to discriminate between our personal Dharma obligation and individual duties and our group Dharma and responsibilities and uh, he says that when, when a disciple sees and relates his individual Dharma and his group responsibility then he is able to take the right action now it is interesting that CDP had an intensely analytical fifth ray mind but was lacking discrimination that's what he says to her and we will be dealing why it was that with, when we arrive at that instruction where he's actually telling her that now I would like to bring attention uh, to one important point in her chat and it, this is the placement of this planet Mars at the last degree of the sign of Taurus in that Capricorn decanet at 29 degree 28 now when we have a planet and is there is uh, I think somewhere he's telling us that uh, in I think in one I don't know in which book now uh, that when we have a planet in the last degrees of a sign it indicates the final stages of the energy of that sign uh, which produce all the development of that factor upon which that sign potently work okay furthermore to my understanding it indicates a shifting of levels because the energy is shifting from one level of energy that is Taurus to the next one in this case the wheel is turning this way anti-clockwise okay uh, so it indicates shifting levels it means planes subplanes which are the levels of consciousness or the stages of the path for CDP as she was taking the final test to enter the path of accepted discipleship she was leaving behind the probationary discipleship and so she was shifting the stages of the path and automatically the levels of consciousness and to this I have no time to go into now 
I can further add to it maybe that uh, the factors which the sign torus works upon in relation to the stage we find CDP are that of illumination. She was developing the Ajna when she was building her garden upon the mental planes. And the Taurus is also the custodian of the intelligently expressed will actuated by the impulse of love at that level where she was. So, as the pledged disciple, she was facing the entry, as I say, of the path of accepted discipleship and moving towards the second initiation where, as I have already mentioned, we need to develop the illumined mind and spiritual intelligence which are necessary requirement for the second initiation. And she was in process moving there. But what is important also to mention here that in Esoteric Astrology, page 388, we are told that the secret of Horus is revealed at the second initiation by the sudden removal or disappearance of world glamour in the blinding energy of light. Now you see how all these points are falling together when we establish the correct stage of the path and the level of consciousness. Because if we got that wrong, then neither of these points would come together as they are coming together in this chart. She also, having the fifth ray line, her uh, it, it is conducive to illumination, knowledge, and to detachment. Because only illumined mind, directed by the will of the soul, can dissipate glamour. But she had to find that will, and I had, I wanted to go and show you where that will is and how to utilize but, you know, we, I don't want this to go uh, later than I can help it. Uh, and we know that the tests of discipleship are all Scorpio, right? Where the mass is the exoteric and esoteric ruler. And where also Pluto, a planet of will in relation to her Dharma, is also a special ruler in Scorpio. Okay? We can see how our glamours are related to our weaknesses. And by recognizing one, we recognize the other. And through this process of recognition, very important word, recognition, we develop our strengths or those qualities we lack basically. In her case was the courage of the soul, uh, detachment particularly, right? And love. So she had many other person glamours, but we have considered only those in relation to the stage of sannyasin, to the duty, dharma, and obligation 
according, you know, uh, to her stage of the path. Um, if I continued any further, I wouldn't be able, you know, to stop because it, it would, uh, you know, uh, create uh, confusion. So, I am going to stop here and uh, thank you for your uh, attention, uh, patience through this process, particularly for those who are not very versed in astrology. And um, as I said, I have shared my understanding of these spheres, which I have for the first time looked at in preparation for this webinar. So it is only my present understanding and I was not able to go into much details about them. So if there are any comments or questions, please. I don't see any hands yet and I don't see any comments. They're all odd. <laughs> well, I'm not really demanding any questions or comments because I realize if I was present there, I, I would be really uh, maybe thinking hard what to ask. Uh, but maybe there are some people who, you know, have their own understanding and I would welcome they share it. You have a couple of uh, thank yous and um, how comprehensive and excellent, uh, but still no comments or hands raised um, relative, you know, other than thank you, such an excellent presentation. Well, you know, it inspires me when it inspires you. Let's show a raise of hands of how many of you have been inspired. <laughs> there, they all go up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, if that's it, um, okay, there's a couple of hands. Is that from being inspired or... Uh, do you guys still have questions? Okay, all right. Hands have all gone down. All right, well, then um, I will stop the recording and, and end the webinar unless you have any other comments. Your next webinar is going to be the 25th of October. Yes, and, and uh, uh, can I say that I am so pleased with a little bit of struggle I managed to conclude the first instruction, so the next webinar, uh, we will be dealing uh, uh, with the second instruction, and uh, I, I don't know yet, you know, um, what particular part of it, obviously not the one, uh, which will be indicated uh, on the, when the BL is sending the invitation for the next webinar, what specific points will be discussed in relation to the second, in this second instruction, which would be very good if you, if you at least read that instruction, second instruction. Okay, Elena, you have a question from Risa. Where did you come to the realization that the fourth and tenth house were so important in terms of Dharma and responsibility? Uh, uh, it is a general knowledge in esoteric astrology. Uh, I have not arrived at it myself, you see. Even at the normal astrology, uh, they are the, what it's called, zenith, which is the highest point in the chart in relation, you know, to the ten, ten cusp. Uh, related to the Capricorn, and the lowest point, you know, uh, Cancer rules the fourth house, uh, which is 
uh, which is our home on the lower level, our home where we live. But on a higher level where we should live is the usher. Okay? And the highest authority could be a government, but for us it is the hierarchy or Shambhala. But that's the simplest way I can answer that. Uh, okay, it was the ashram is the fourth that I needed understanding. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other comments then or hands. So, um, last call. Goodbye to everybody. Yes, thank you again for participating in this late hour. But tomorrow is Sunday, you can sleep late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night everybody then I'm going to end the webinar. Okay. And Thank that you. that uh Elena that's going to stop your recording when I do that, okay? Uh, I stop recording? No, the we me ending the webinar will stop it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.